I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to cancer survivor and mother of four, Victoria English Martin, who is a 50-year-old from Denver, Colorado. Victoria has a background in nutrition and fitness, and she's been alcohol-free now for more than two years. And Victoria has made alcohol-free coaching her passion, and she is now one of our outstanding Project 90 coaches who help many of our Project 90 clients to get power over their drinking. Victoria, so great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, James. Happy to be here. Now, tell us a little bit about being a cancer survivor. I know you had you were diagnosed with breast cancer in 2018, so tell us about that journey. Sure. Uh, well, I have always, as you know, my background is in nutrition and fitness, so I always prided myself on being a very, very healthy woman. I followed all of my doctor's instructions, started getting my annual mammograms at age 40, and was diligent about going every year. Uh, I had my mammogram in July of 2017. Everything was clear. I had finished a workout in April of 2018. I was all sweaty. I had a dinner to attend. I got in the shower. And as I was washing myself, I felt something that I could have sworn hadn't been there the day before. It was uh, about the size of a, of a good size half dollar. And I said, oh, this doesn't feel right. So I immediately went to the doctor. They, it was just like you would imagine in the movies, you're in your pink robe. Uh, they're bringing the other women in. The other women are going home. They keep bringing you back into the room. And finally, the radiologist came in. Uh, she did the ultrasound and she was very, very quiet. And finally she said, this is ugly. This is cancer. Uh, and I'm very, very glad that I did go to the doctor when I did. Oftentimes doctors will say, well, if you feel something, come back in a few months. If it changes or grows or becomes painful, we'll check it. Well, had I done that, James, I wouldn't be here today. My type of cancer was triple negative breast cancer, which typically strikes women ages 50 and under. Uh, it's extremely aggressive. My doctor likened it to wildfire. So in the time since I had had my mammogram in July until I found the lump and was diagnosed, uh, it had gone to stage 2B, meaning that it had started to progress up the chain of lymph nodes, which was... <laughs> basically a breath, a breath away from being stage four, meaning it would have spread into my bones or organs, brain, and that would have been that. So another passion of mine is advocacy for breast cancer awareness, not just, well, not awareness, but education. We all know that we're all aware of breast cancer, but how much do you really know? And one of the things I want your listeners to know is that if you feel something do something, do not wait. If they tell you to come back, plant yourself in that chair until they do what they need to do, whether it's uh, an ultrasound, another mammogram, or in my case, a biopsy. Uh, I underwent uh, 16 rounds of chemo, uh, 28 radiations, a double mastectomy, a full hysterectomy, six months of oral chemotherapy, and I've lost count. I want to say nine or 10 surgeries. So it was a hell of a run. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful to be here today and obviously extremely passionate about sharing this with, with other women and their families. Mm. Thank you for sharing what you went through. Uh, as a mother of four, how did it feel when you were first diagnosed and then how did those feelings change over the course of your journey, including the chemo and the operations? Mm -hmm. It was extremely difficult, as you can imagine, to tell any, anybody who loves you that uh, you're sick, um, let alone your children. I had been the one that they counted on. 
Um, so I was going to go home. My father lives in Florida and my three adult children who were in college at the time were in college in Florida. And I was going to fly home and go see each of them individually and tell them in person. My oncologist said that was not an option. Uh, we had to start chemo right away. So unfortunately, I had to tell my family via FaceTime. So it was extremely difficult, uh, very challenging. The good news was once they did the scans and they saw that it had not progressed to my bones or organs, uh, I had they, they were almost certain that I would survive. So uh, if it comes back, <laughs> it comes back as stage four. But today it's not back. So uh, I knew almost with certainty that I would survive. So I was able to give them that. However, I was going to have to uh, step down as the matriarch and allow my children to fend for themselves a bit more than a mother likes to, uh, even though they are older. I also have a, a daughter who was only nine at the time. That was very hard. Um, so it was very challenging. I remember one time I was in some sort of a, one of those tubes. I don't even remember what sort of scan. And my son kept calling me. He had some issue maybe about how to cook a chicken breast and <laughs> he was blowing up my phone. And finally I said, honey, what's up? And he's like, oh, what do I do with this chicken? I'm like, Daniel. <laughs> and he said, oh, wait, 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 I forgot. Okay. I can't come to you for everything. So, uh, it was, it was, you know, a little humor injected there, but, um, it was, it was hard. It was hard for them to see me sick. And it was, I think even more difficult for me to allow them to see me sick, to see me as, um, fragile and ill. What did you discover about yourself through the journey? Well, I discovered that I sometimes do have to accept help. I had to realize that I can't do it all. Uh, I had my external armor removed. I had always uh, you don't realize how much you hide behind your external armor, your looks, your figure, everything until it's gone. I remember one evening in the middle of the night going to the bathroom and the moonlight was shining through my bathroom window. And by that point, I had lost my hair, my eyebrows, my lashes. I'd had my breasts removed. And I just thought, wow, that's me. That's me. That's just my soul. That's Victoria. All of that other stuff was just adornments. And um, so it was humbling, but it was also liberating in many ways. It put me very much in touch with who I am, the essence of who I am. And uh, in some ways, I wouldn't trade that, as crazy as that may sound. Well, how do you feel that like you're a different person now than pre-diagnosis? I mean, you you obviously went through a physical and sounds like spiritual transformation through mm -hmm. this process. So who was Victoria pre-diagnosis and who's Victoria now post-operations, post-chemo and, and seemingly with a clean bill of health? Mm -hmm. Yes, thankfully. Uh, Victoria before was a good person, but a guarded person, uh, someone who felt the need to present uh, as always being strong and permeable. And I used uh, my exterior armor, as I call it, and alcohol to I thought maintain that facade. I wouldn't allow myself to access difficult emotions. Um, often I would use alcohol to access emotions I was uncomfortable with when I was not drinking. So that when I was not, when I was without alcohol in my system, I could uh, present to the world as being strong and 
fearless and um, relentless in my pursuits. Cancer takes that away from you. Uh, you simply cannot do what you could do before. So I had to learn to ask for help and accept help. Uh, and yes, my, my, my spirit has changed. I have a much more uh, intentional life. I am extremely, even after all of the the treatment that I've been through, my body is still not the same. Physically, it will never be the same. Obviously, I don't look the same. I've had reconstruction and everything, but I'm different. Uh, but more importantly, I I have to be careful where I put my time and my energy because I, those are limited resources. I've always known that, but now I really know it. And so I am intentional with whom I spend my time. I'm intentional with with whom I allow into my life. And that has actually resulted in a much better quality of life. I do not listen to very much news. <laughs> I, I think of myself as, uh, you know, I, I, I have so many spoons in a day and, and this spoon goes to self-development and this personal growth, this this spoon goes to my spirituality. This one goes to my physical exercise. This one goes to my family. This one goes to healthy cooking. And when those spoons have been used up for the day, then I put myself to bed with a good book and a cup of tea and it's a good day. In hindsight, when you're looking back, do you feel your, uh, cancer diagnosis, how much of it do you feel was just a uh, hereditary thing, bad luck? How much of it do you uh, attribute to lifestyle choices, whether that be either foods you were eating or alcohol or maybe suppressing um, emotions that you didn't want to face? Have you thought about that a little bit? I have. That's a good question. So my particular type of cancer, as I mentioned, was triple negative breast cancer. And it turns out that I carry the BRCA1 mutation. That is a, a genetic mutation, which I had no family history. Uh, my father comes from a very, very large family. And it turns out, well, my mother passed 20 something years ago, so I don't know if she carried it. My father carries the mutation. So I apparently inherited it from my the paternal side of my family, but we had no family history. So I never thought to get tested. But being, test, being born with that genetic mutation gave me, I was born with a about a 75% chance of getting breast cancer. I had no idea. Had I known, I would have had a double mastectomy and had my breasts removed and probably never gotten cancer. I didn't know that. So uh, I did ask the doctor, did my, did my alcohol consumption have anything to do with this? And he said, well, cancer increases, alcohol increases, it seems, it appears, increases the risk of hormone-driven breast cancers, which are the more common ones. They're slower growing, they're less aggressive, they're things like that. However, Alcohol can also uh, damage your cellular DNA. So I can't say that alcohol contributed to my breast cancer risk because I was born with a very high risk. However, it didn't help. I was, as I said, you know, a nutritionist. I was, they used to call me the green juice girl. I was the one, I was juicing before juicing was cool. Kale salad, what's kale? You know, I was the one making the kale salads. What is this crunchy, weird stuff? But you can't, you can't out nutrition, the bad effects of alcohol. And I know that now. And so I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it. Um, but I know that I didn't help my immune function. I didn't do myself any favors with the alcohol. Uh, but I was born with a very, very high risk uh, of getting it anyway. What was your alcohol of choice and how often and regularly were you consuming it? So I was uh, I was a quote, normal drinker. 
in my 20s. I had three children in my 20s. I don't remember ever having more than a couple of glasses, maybe at dinner. Uh, there was some alcohol misuse in my in my family, so I, I thought I was aware of what it looked like. I didn't look like that. Uh, and I figured, okay, well, I dodged that. I, I don't have to worry about that. And then my mother died when I was 29, and it was very traumatic time. And this was 1999. There was not the awareness that there is now around mental health and anxiety and things like that. So after my mom died, I was having what I know now uh, are anxiety attacks. I was a runner back then. I used to run five or six miles a day. Suddenly, I couldn't run more than a mile without being bent over trying to breathe. And guess what? A glass of wine really helped me catch my breath. <laughs> I had three little children and um, it started like that, a glass of wine. And then it was two, then it was three. Then it was uh, putting the bottle away before my husband would come home and pretend to open another one. And it was a very, very slow descent. It wasn't, um, there, there were no big firework moments where someone said, you're falling apart. I was just self-medicating. And that went on for a couple of years. And then I said, you know, this is kind of getting to be a problem. So I stopped for a while. And then I went through a divorce in 2002 or three, and the wine came back. I, again, was using it to self-medicate. I was uh, hanging out with girlfriends, you know, and wine was the, wine was what we did. We, we had wine. If you had a good day, you drank wine. If you had a bad day, you drank wine. And that's how it started. That's how the, you know, the uh, dependence began. Uh, and that continued off and on for several years. So it was mostly wine. Uh, I did, I did like my vodka, <laughs> but wine and vodka, just, you know, just your average mom with a drink, wine and vodka, nothing too exciting. <laughs> At what point did you choose to give the alcohol away or at the very least when did you choose to reduce the consumption like did you actually reduce it and then stop or did you just go hard stop and just talk, talk a little bit about when that was in relation to cancer diagnosis and operations and chemo etc sure well i had had periods of time starting around 2009 when I realized it was becoming a problem because I was doing all those things that people do promising I wouldn't drink until Friday, promising I wouldn't have vodka, promising I wouldn't drink until, you know, all the things and it never worked. So then I would give it up. And then because I had my default coping skill had become drinking whenever a major crisis would hit by this point, I had three teenagers Whenever something would happen that I would think was a crisis that was unmanageable, the alcohol would come back. So that went off. It was frustrating. It took up so much mental space and energy. But when uh, before I was diagnosed, I had been without alcohol for several months and was doing pretty well, but still feeling kind of angry about it, resentful, deprived, all the things because of society and kept questioning, maybe I'll give it a try again. Well, then I was diagnosed and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm about to fight for my life. There is no way I will ever drink again. That's, that's never going to happen. It will never happen. And of course, when I was going through treatment, it didn't. I was sick as a dog. Um, so imagine my surprise <laughs> when, when the emotional fallout happened after all of the treatment and after going through this battle like a warrior, because that's how we are, right? We put our heads down. We do what we have to do. And then suddenly you're alone. The doctor's appointments have ended. Your body is scarred. Your head is a mess. And the whispers started, 
I thought, well, I would feel a little better. So I had a brief period, maybe a few weeks, where I picked it up again. It did not go well. Uh, nobody knew except my oncologist. And it, of course, my body was so compromised that I couldn't metabolize it. My liver enzymes were going up. I had never had anything like that. And uh, he said, you just fought for your life. Are you really going to let this take you out? And that was it for me. That's when I knew. That's when I knew. And that's when I, um, that's when I gave it up for good. And uh, wow. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful statement. You just you just fought for your life. Mm -hmm. Are you really going to? What did he say? Are you really going to let this take you out? Oh wow! Yeah, are you really going to let this take you out? Mm -hmm. Because he realized. Well, I realized as well that being compromised the way I I was at that point that it. It was not going to be a long road. If I had kept, if I had continued, if I'd gone back to drinking, it would have caused some serious damage very, very quickly. Not to mention my mental health and my emotional well-being was was shot. And certainly alcohol wasn't doing me any favors. So that's when I made the decision to really dig in and do the work on every level, physically, emotionally, spiritually, to to get to get rid of this this damn thing. <laughs> mm. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, we all in, we're all intelligent people. We all understand mm -hmm. and accept that alcohol compromises our health. Mm -hmm. And knowing this, we still participate in consuming it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that you were going through cancer treatment, mm -hmm. your body's changed, mm -hmm. you've, you've literally given up mm -hmm. parts of your body, mm -hmm. you're trying to recover, you're trying to get through, mm -hmm. you, you're, intel you're an intelligent woman, you know that drinking alcohol is simply drinking attractively packaged poison. Yes. Why do you feel that you were still so compelled to consume it, even despite all of your health concerns? Mm -hmm. That was the question I couldn't answer. I felt like a mad woman. I felt like I was going insane. What the hell is wrong with me? But now, James, I understand, and you understand this because of what you do. When I started drinking the way I drank after my mother passed, and I was trying to cope with trauma. My brain, this primitive part of our brain, right? The fight or flight, it learned that if we are in fear, if we are in danger, we have to protect ourselves. Whatever you do, the brain learns that's what we do. So Having gone through cancer, being left with physical pain, physical, you know, scars, emotional scars, they liken it to, um, it's, well, it is PTS. Uh, and not knowing how to make sense of all of this. My brain said, wait, I know this feeling. We're afraid we think we might die. And you're also left with the fear of recurrence, of course, that the, that the damn thing might come back. So every time you have a headache, every time a bone hurts, is it, is it back? Is it back? So you're, you're constantly in this hyper aware state. My brain said, well, I know what to do. I know how to keep you safe, Victoria. Drink. Where's my stuff? Where's my medicine? Where's my safety? That's what we do to keep Victoria safe. And I had not yet, number one, understood that. And more importantly, changed those neural pathways so that I had an actual safe thing to do so that my brain could learn that we're okay. And that's why. 
because believe me, I had to get to the bottom of it. And I think that's what led me into doing what I do today because I thought, I am I that stupid? Am I that crazy? Uh, but now I now it makes sense. Well, of course it wanted alcohol. It was trying to keep me safe. It thought I was in danger. So, yeah. You're one of our Project 90 coaches now doing an outstanding job of helping our clients to Thank you. get power over alcohol. Do you see in our clients some of the same thought patterns or behaviours or feelings that you experienced around the time that you finally said no to alcohol or that alcohol was driving Mm -hmm. you to consume it? And what are those same behaviours and thoughts and and feelings that you see? Mm -hmm. I do. I think, number one, because, as you say, it's attractively packaged poison, we are not adequately uh, educated about what this substance is. It is a highly addictive substance. So if you drink enough of it, especially under the right circumstances, such as stress, your brain will want it. It's an addictive substance. Number two, society. What do they tell us? If you're, if you're upset, if you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable, use alcohol. It works. Nobody talks about what happens physiologically 30 minutes after you consume the alcohol and how the dopamine and serotonin crash. No one talks about that. They talk about how good you're going to feel. And so that's what we're sold. We're sold that bill of goods. And then finally, there's the level of self. And we all have that self, right? Whatever it is, we all have things going on in our lives that we'd rather not face. Maybe they're uncomfortable to face. It doesn't have to be something as dramatic as cancer. Mine wasn't always as dramatic as cancer. It could have been that, you know, my my kid got in trouble at school or or whatever, <laughs> right? Whatever your brain perceives as intolerable. It's very natural that with enough time and conditioning physiologically and through society and through what we learn in our own body, in the way that we walk through the world, that yes, I think to some degree, all of our, all of our members are experiencing this in, very, in varying degrees. And that's why I don't like to quantify crisis or trauma. My, my trauma could have been much worse. Uh, mine could have been much better. I don't like to compare. It's, it's not the experience. It's the feeling and what it produces in our bodies, the, the level of cortisol, the, the stress response, right? So if that's happening in your body and you're using alcohol to, to calm that down, and not only is it expected, in society, it's discouraged if you don't use it, then it's kind of a perfect storm to end up with these with these issues. If there's one thing, if there was one, uh, I wouldn't say trick, but if there was one habit that worked for you to consistently remain alcohol free, what was it or what is it? You're a coach in in Project 90. What's one of the more effective ways of helping our clients to get power over alcohol? Certainly gratitude tempered with honesty about what is bothering us. I was one of those who was always the glass was always, always half full. And I don't just mean my wine glass. (laughs) Mm -hmm. My wine glass was usually pretty empty. No, but my glass was always half full. I was the one people would say, oh, this must be difficult. Oh, but it could be so much worse. Well, that didn't allow me to process the pain that I was in, the anger, the sadness, the grief. So yes, you can have gratitude and you can also have honesty that, yes, I am grateful. I am grateful to be alive. I'm also very sad 
that my body went through what it went through. I'm sad that it, that I've gone through some of the things I have. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be anything that major. It can, it can be anything. Your feelings are your feelings. So I think that's my, my, um, that's the key for me is to always, always stay in gratitude, but also always acknowledge if I am having uncomfortable feelings and learn to deal with them in a healthy way. And it doesn't always have to be pretty. I can scream into a pillow. I can turn on really obnoxious Lincoln Park metal music, whatever, whatever. Get it out. Don't keep it in. Because if it gets in, it's just like anything else. It sits there and it festers. And that's not going to come out in a, in a good way. So uh, you may have heard me say on, on calls before that whatever we do when we're alcohol-free, it might not be pretty, but I promise it's going to be nicer than what we would have done with those feelings with alcohol in our system. <laughs> so I can wake up the next day and say, well, maybe I could have phrased that a little bit better, but at least I don't have a dumpster fire because I didn't completely blow up and act, you know, just lose it on everyone because I haven't learned to process and express myself in a healthy way. So yeah, authenticity, I guess, is is a short way of answering that question. You could have done many things when you uh, came out of your cancer treatments and you got back to health and maybe you felt like you had a clean slate and now you're, um, you know, ready for the future and you're ready to attack life in a really positive way and you've chosen to help people, amongst other things, get power over alcohol. Mm -hmm. You could have done a million things. Why have you chosen this path? Because, because when I, when I, when I see the world, when I see the way that we are targeted with this addictive substance, it ticks me off. It makes me, it, I feel number one, I feel duped because I am an intelligent woman. I am a healthy woman. And I felt a little duped that this, this junk was sold to me as a magical elixir and it's quite the opposite. So the other reason is, so I want to, to create awareness so that when you're walking through the market and you see all of these, all of these bottles, especially the way they target women these days, I mean, the alcohol, the alcohol related deaths in women have skyrocketed and it's because now they have all of these beautiful pink bottles and mommy juice and wine bottles even uh, donate to Breast Cancer Awareness Month now. I mean, it's maddening. So that gets me upset. And when we get upset, the best thing we can do is advocate and educate. So I do that. And the other thing is um, because when I realized that I was having an issue with alcohol, there weren't women like me out in the public eye. It was before social media. The only uh, women which they slap labels on, drunk moms, alcoholic moms. I thought they were the people you saw in the, in the National Enquirer going to rehab. I thought they were mothers who had, you know, unkempt children. And there, there, there was no one out there that looked like me, who was intelligent, who had her act together, but had this problem. And so I thought, I never thought I would come forward with my story. But after a while, I realized I need to. I need to, because people, perhaps one person will watch me and say, wow, that sounds like me. I can relate to her. Huh. Okay. It's not a character flaw to get, to become dependent on an addictive substance that is expected in our society. So if I can help people, then, you know, like I say, I'm still here. I may as well make myself useful. <laughs> hmm. And, uh, how has your experience been so far as a coach within Project 90? What's uh, Maybe you could just articulate what Project 90 is and, and how you felt about it so far as one of our top coaches now, mm -hmm. helping and working closely with our clients 
for our listeners or viewers here who may be curious about what the experience might be like? What's what are your thoughts on it? Sure. Well, I have followed you, James, online for a few years, not not in a creepy way, just observing. What I always liked about the way you present this is it's not about being this or that. It's not about labels. It's about is alcohol making your life as wonderful as it claims it will? Is it? If it isn't, let's check it out. Let's see what it's like. It doesn't matter if you're having two glasses of wine a few times a week and you're realizing that you're feeling bloated and a little puffy and a little fatigued. Your runs aren't as sharp as they used to be. Maybe you're not as ready for your morning meetings. Or if if you are waking up nauseous with a hangover and missing those meetings uh, and damaging relationships, there's it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's just that question. Is alcohol making your life better? If not, come hang out with us and let's talk about it. Let's see what life looks like without it. There's no judgment. There's no labels. You don't have to pick up any chips. You don't have to shame yourself. You don't have to just be yourself. And um, that has always appealed to me. And of course, when I uh, became alcohol free, that was that's that's the school of thought to which I subscribe, and so that's why I was so excited whenever we when when we were able to when I was able to join your team, uh, and the community is what's just so phenomenal. I love to see someone come in, you know, and and they they don't know what to say when they're looking into the into the video and introducing themselves and they're nervous and and they're just enveloped by the community. It's okay, you can say anything here. We've got you. And they say that and the next day they show up again and you can tell they're a little more comfortable. They're a little more comfortable and then if someone's going into a challenging situation, oh, you know, I'm going to see a bunch of friends I used to you know, throw them back with, and I'm having seltzer. What am I going to do? You can put that out there and you, there's, there's no judgment. There's no labels. There's nothing. It's like, I don't feel like drinking today. And I don't know how to say that to people. Okay. Well, we got you. So I think the community is just incredible. And then of course, when we see our members graduate from the program and still stay in touch with the members, there's real friendships that develop in there. And so many times that's what we're seeking with alcohol is connection. And what we come to find is that what we're seeking is just connection with people. And you've done a phenomenal job of creating that. And I'm just so happy to be a part of it. And uh, as you can tell, sort of passionate about what I do. So, so, so looking forward to, to growing with you and, and just helping more people. Victoria English Martin, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Uh, obviously you've been through some challenging times and it seems like you're thriving now. Does it feel that way? It does. It does. I'm, I'm, I'm a happy, happy woman. Beautiful. I love that. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for opening up and sharing your story with us. And thank you for the outstanding work that you continue to do with our community inside of project 90. And if you, uh, are listening or watching and you'd like to send Victoria uh, a message, then please do. Where can they, where can they send you a message, Victoria? Um, I don't know. Where can they send me a message? <laughs> you can send, have you got, are you on social media? I am on social media. I guess uh, you can find me at uh, Victoria at after the crisis coaching.com. You can find me on Instagram at Victoria English 1111 and Facebook Victoria English Martin. All right. Lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you, James. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. 
You can also text the word quit guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word quit guide to the number 44222, or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time.